Hello, I am Joel Bloom at New Jersey Institute of Technology. We pride ourselves on being part of the Newark community and its advancements in technology, the economy, and the growth of the city. That's why we are very proud to partner with the Caucus Educational Corporation to produce Newark at the Crossroads right here on the NGIT campus. We hope you enjoy this special series. Funding for this special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato at NJIT has been provided by NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology, The Fidelco Group, Barnabas Health, Life is Better Healthy, Prudential Financials Global Communications Department, TD Bank, Verizon Communications, and by PSE&G, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities. Promotional support provided by NJ Biz. All business, all New Jersey, and by Commerce Magazine. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. You see, Italian you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. Man, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. We saw people breaking into windows and stealing stuff, carrying televisions down the street. We stood on our second floor porch and looked out over the neighborhood and fire engines going everywhere, police cars going everywhere. While authorities hoped to quell the disturbance with the addition of state police and the National Guard, before long, both law enforcement and the public were afraid of what would happen next. Everyone seemed to be convinced that everyone else was shooting at them. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. We're at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. This is One on One. This is a series uh, called Nork at a Crossroads, and uh, we are joined by a very important guest who can talk about Nork when it was at a different crossroads, Kevin McLaughlin. Producer, director, documentary filmmaker. Uh, the film that he has out is called The Week That Changed the World, The Nork Riots, 1967. Right. So along with some other folks who remembered, I was a little kid in Newark, and it changed our world. You know, Certainly. National Guard, state troopers, tanks on the streets. Right. People were scared to death. 26 people were killed. Countless businesses were destroyed, and it changed the city's reputation and its life forever, right? That's right. And Why'd you do this? Well, I was looking for a story to tell. I'm a storyteller, a filmmaker, and, uh, you know, this one just, I grew up with it. It was well, your dad, a, your dad has a real connection to the city, right? My dad was a fireman in the city. The, my family goes in Newark back to 1920, so I grew up there. And, and he, him being a fireman, I knew that that was an end to guys? the story. Valesburg, absolutely, yeah. I don't know how I just, you just, you just know Valesburg <laughs> guys. Well, so, half the cops and firemen lived in Valesburg, right? It's not so, stereotype. Stop, okay? It's, it's true. An Irish fireman from Valesburg, I'm not going to, I'm going to leave that alone. Believe it or not, it happens. Okay. They're out there. So you decide to tell this story. Right. What was the reaction around you? Did anyone uh, say, leave it alone? Yes, plenty of people said, why do you want to talk about this? Leave it in the past, it's a horrible memory. And, but they were a minority. I mean, most people were, uh, understand that it's important to talk about it. And the, and the fact that these things are happening now in Ferguson and Baltimore is proof that we haven't fully learned the lesson that can be learned from these things, that it's a tragedy and we have to do everything we can to avoid it happening mm -hmm. again. So I, I thought it was useful and, and uh, a good thing to do to, to study that and, and let people see how it happens from the beginning and see what it does to the community and to people over decades afterwards. So it's five days, July 12th through the 17th of 1967. Right. You talked to what kind of people? I talked to anyone I, I could find who was there who remembered it. So cops, firemen, National Guard, state troopers, those were fairly easy to find because they all belonged to some kind of organization. But then I wanted regular people, just citizens who remembered. And that was a little harder to dig up. But I, it, after, Father, what'd your dad tell you? Uh, he has never been a big one for war stories, but you know, he did say that uh, it was kind of a, a bizarre thing for him that he had never expected to be shot at when he signed on to be yeah. a fireman. Yeah, but, we need to put this in perspective. Um, there were snipers in buildings. There were literally snipers in buildings shooting at cops and firemen who were trying to go in and help people, protect people. Am I, am I exaggerating? Well, it depends on who you talk to. And that's oh, no, there were, there, uh, there, 
There are conflicting stories about whether there were snipers? Oh, yeah, that's a, a huge controversy among some people. And I, I, there's a segment in the film where we talk about that, where a number of people say that that's a myth, that there were no snipers, and others say that there absolutely were because they saw them. So you can. Ju I try to get every perspective in this film and let the viewer decide what they believe is the truth. But, but you also talk to people who talk about different perspectives. I mean, growing up as a kid, I said I was a kid during the Newark riots. You talk to people who don't even call it a riot. You talk to people who say it was the Newark rebellion. Right. Again, that's one of those controversies, and, and it's interesting what people said about that. For the most part, you, you could predict that most of the white people call it a riot, and a lot of the black folks would prefer to call it a rebellion. And the rebellion was also re it was referred to by the great, late Dr. Clement Price, who was a great mentor and friend of ours, who called it a rebellion. Well, he was one of many people who, who explained that and explained it very well. He uses a great analogy where he said that uh, the, the Boston Tea Party is an example of something that we all think of as a, a rise of discontent mm. against the crown, but people in England saw it as a riot. So it's all a matter of perspective. Uh, but then again, the people who I spoke to who, who prefer to call it a rebellion, in the very next sentence, without exception, referred to it as a riot because that's what it's called. But, 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 but the businesses that were destroyed were in black communities. The, the people who were killed disproportionately were black. Right, right. So, so those who argued that it was rebellion, what was it a rebellion against, according to those who you spoke to? Well, it was a rebellion against the, the oppression of the black community, which by all uh, evidence that I see was certainly was Especially real. by the police department? By the police and the community in general, the the uh, the, uh, the power of the, the white powers, the structure. powers that be, the government, you know, was not just flat out open racism, but things like uh, plans to obliterate neighborhoods by building highways or medical schools That's and right. whatnot that that didn't consider the needs of the people who were living there. So there was certainly a, legi a legitimate complaint, but I think that that spilled over and became a riot because there were a lot of people who just rushed in, took the opportunity mm -hmm. to get a free television. In your interviews, how graphic were the descriptions of the violence? Oh, some of them were extremely graphic, and uh, presenting them in a way that could be shown on television was a challenge. Uh, one of the most graphic descriptions I got was from a, a state trooper, excuse me, a, a National Guardsman, Craig Mirop, who witnessed a state trooper beating two suspects probably to death. We don't know to this day whether they were killed, but they were taken away unconscious after being physically beaten while handcuffed. While handcuffed. Right. And that's a very graphic description that is in the film. And, and I think it's an important thing to show that th these things happened. And uh, to learn about it hopefully prevents those kind of things from happening yeah, in the future. It's interesting with Ferguson and Baltimore on the heels of that, this film. But that wasn't why you did it. No, I started long before those things when happened. When did you start? Uh, this took about five years. So it's, it's been in the works for quite a while. How do you, how do you finance something like this? That's a big question. That's, you know, <laughs> this was, that, that's it's one of the reasons Financing it took, public television is not easy either, right. but I can't imagine this. That's one of the reasons it took five years, because when you're a one-man team with no money, things move very slowly. <laughs> but I did get two grants, uh, one from the FM Kirby Foundation, which is a New Jersey-based sure. family foundation, and from the New Jersey... New Jersey Council for the Humanities. So without those, I never could have gotten it done. And what happens now to the film in terms of distribution? Talk about it. We're waiting to hear from some film festivals, talking to distributors. I expect it to get out there. You know, it's, it's something that not everyone understands. But uh, the fact that these kind of things are still happening makes it something that, that uh, people want to see. The narrator more. of the film, Andre Brower? Right. Important guy. Yeah, a Who great, great actor who's he's best known uh, probably for Homicide, Life on the Streets. He's now starring in a show called Brooklyn Nine-Nine. He's terrific. He's got a killer voice. He's the captain. Right. He's right. great. Yeah, and uh, he, he actually contributed more than just his voice because he was actually the first black person to see the whole thing and, and offer that perspective. So he kind of sh helped shape the narration based on, on his perspective. Finally, before I let you go, the reaction of family members closest to you to the film? They, they like it. People are uh, impressed with it. They, I was concerned about how people would uh, perceive it as whether it's biased. And people on all sides of the equation seem to feel that it's very balanced. So I'm pleased with that. Real quick, how did it change you? 
the, the, the riot or the film? The film. Um, it's, it's taught me, I think, more to, to keep all perspectives in mind and try to cover every angle and give everybody their say. Uh, Kevin McLaughlin, I want to thank you. Um, producer, director, documentary filmmaker of a very important film called The Week That Changed the World, The New York Riots. We're going to uh, bump out with um, a clip from the end of this very important film. Check it out. It's very important. Thank you, Kevin. Be right back. Thank you. There was a pride here in Newark that never was abandoned by its people. And those folks in the city are now starting to see their day uh, as our city begins to turn around. I just think that this city will go ablaze again, that we will be on fire. And it's not going to be an inferno of riot and rage, of bigotry and hate, but I think that it's going to be a different type of fire. It'll be the, the blaze of hope, the blaze of opportunity, uh, the very torch of the American dream. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We're joined by Samer Hanini, who is the principal of uh, the Hanini Group. How are you doing? Been good. You're doing important so work. Far. The uh, Hanini Group is? We are uh, we're local developers in downtown Newark. Uh, we've been here for a while. Uh, I'm actually a graduate. Who's we, two brothers? Me and my brother. We're, uh, we're partners. And you're uh, graduated from this place? I'm a, oh, yeah, it all started here, NJIT. I did my undergrad in architecture, and I mastered in, uh, in planning. So in why is it that of all the places you could be developing, you picked Newark, New Jersey? <sighs> well, like I said, it started here. And I think uh, you know, going through the School of Architecture, you do a lot of case studies. and we. We were always pitched these projects in Newark, so we would, they would literally throw these things at us and you'd look at them for months at a time. And I think because of all that time and experience, it kind of you know, shined a light on the value of Newark. You know, what's here, uh, the, the history is unbelievable. You just walk around, I'm, I'm a huge history guy. And, 350 uh, year anniversary next year. in 2016. Next year, right. yeah. So you walk around the streets of Newark and you just look up and the, the, the buildings that are here are unbelievable. And you know, with school and this, we figured this is the place we want to start. And we did our first project, uh, bought it actually off of a, a city auction off the city of Newark. Get out That's of how here. we started. You yeah. went to one of those city auctions? I did. All right, I got to ask you, how much? <laughs> $315,000. What was it? It was on, uh, on Washington, on Washington and Market Street. We actually bought it without entering the building. And, but well, we, how did you know what was there? It, was, it, it had good bones. We felt the location was great. Hold it was on, back up. Bone. It had good bones. What, what do I do? I look like <laughs> I would know what good bones. <laughs> when you go to auction, I'll let you know how it works out. But, uh, but, but you, you sense that it had what it needed in terms of the infrastructure? Uh, Newark, I mean, you know, what I learned in school, I realized that any, any asset in Newark is valuable because of its location. And Newark, as far as infrastructure, Trains, uh, airport, seaport, the rails, the universities. You have 40,000 students that come. Mm. I mean, you, the value is here. You just have to mm. find the, you know, just got to kind of go for it. Yeah, let's talk about one of the uh, really interesting, particularly interesting projects, Hotel Indigo. We're going to show some uh, pictures, some visuals. Describe it. It's, it's, it's a really great project. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a gorgeous building. It's a good-looking building built in 1912 by a very famous uh, American architect. What was it? Uh, Cass Gilbert. It was built by. It was. Uh, it was built by Cass Gilbert. It was a, a national bank building. It was a national bank building. Yeah. So at the same location, they actually had their original headquarters. They knocked the headquarters down, and then they built this tower. So finished in 1912. Uh, it was. We were told it's the tallest building in New Jersey when it was built. Uh, wow. And it sat vacant when we got it. It sat vacant for about 30 years. And that's kind of like the story of the buildings in Newark. They, beautiful building to sit around. And uh, another one we bought on auction that was through the uh, through the insurance commission, and uh, we uh, we kind of we decided we wanted to make it into a hotel. Describe uh, Hotel Indigo. What is it? What kind of hotel? So it's a it's a boutique style hotel. It's uh, run by IHG Intercontinental Hotels, one of the largest uh, hotel franchise in the world, and this is their boutique model. We chose Indigo because it allowed you to be flexible with the design, and the building kind of lent itself to be a boutique style hotel. If you look at it, it's just it's a, it's a gorgeous, tall, slender building, has a lot of character. 
uh, we felt that would be the best fit for the building. But you're also very aware of the importance of jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, my understanding is you've worked with some folks to make sure that some of these jobs go to Norkers. How so, do you do that? So one of the, one of the most important things as, as developers, I mean, at a company level, we feel that we have to always work with the community. And the hotel on the go gave us that opportunity. Uh, working with the city Department of Labor, we set up a, a hospitality uh, training program. So it allowed us to take local Newarkers, put them through a, pro a program through Essex County College, which trained them in the hospitality business. So when we were done with the project, on the operations level, we were able to hire those and they're fully trained through a, a state agency. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, when we finished the project, we ended up hiring 140 people. 140 people? 140 people. 90% of them local, local Newark Wow. Yeah. And are you involved in the Haynes Project at all? We are. And tell folks why this is, that's important. Uh, the Haynes Building, the empty for about how long? No, 30, 40 years. 30, 40 years. And, and Haynes, if, for those who don't know, was, was the, the Neiman Marcus of their time. It was. It was in the Before your time, not before, before mine. <laughs> I was a kid. I always say the 27 bus from my neighborhood, from uh, Highland Avenue and Newark in the northern section of the city, mm. you jump on the 27 bus, you go downtown, you get off the Haynes building. Gorgeous it building. It's unbelievable. And what we're doing, which I'm very proud of, is I don't know if you recall, but there was this magnificent skylight in the center of the building. I don't remember. I was on the fourth floor. It was actually, at one time, it was covered because of uh, some issues, but we, we're, we're going to actually preserve it. So we took the skylight off of the fourth floor, dropped it to the second floor, so any of the shoppers that come through the Haynes are going to be able to experience wow. the same skylight that people experience. What's it going to be? We have Whole Foods. Yeah, the Whole Foods thing has is big. The, the half of the first floor. We have Rutgers is putting their, some of their arts programs in the building. And then we also have a, over 160 apartments and parking. So The apartments? Uh, very tall, apart, 20, some of them are 15 to 20 foot ceilings. Some of them have, have uh, mezzanines with some loft units. Uh, really grand spaces, uh, you know, that tied with the actual atrium is going to be beautiful. I mean, you know, very How excited. excited are you about the future of the city? Newark, I mean, you feel it now. You go down Halsey Street, now that Prue finished their, their tower, you have all these new, new boutique stores opening up. You're feeling the energy. A lot more developers are coming to town. Uh, I'm excited to see the, the, I feel Newark is starting, it's that, that turn, we're feeling it. And over the next few years, you're gonna see some, some more things sprout out. And you live here, you work here? I live here, I live uh, right on, uh, on Market and, uh, and, and Rim Boulevard. Uh, I work two blocks away. I graduated from NJIT, <laughs> so I'm very, You're very Newark-centric. Newark That's great, man. Listen, yeah. um, you know, the series is called Newark at a Crossroads, and I'm thinking with, with people like yourself, young people like yourself, all in, invested, it's a good thing. Congratulations and thank you, keep it thank up. Thank you, we're excited. Uh, Samer Hanini, who is with his brother, principal in the Hanini Group, Wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Stay right there. We'll be right back right after this from NJIT. Great. That's good stuff. Thanks. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD And follow us on Twitter at steveadubato. We are joined by Mark Bonamo, editor of NewarkInc.com. Good to have you with us, Mark. Great to be here. Thanks. Mark, describe uh, what this site is. NewarkInc.com is an effort started by two former Star Ledger journalists in late 2014, Bruno Tedeschi and Jonathan Jaffe. Uh, they were essentially frustrated by the idea that Newark is on the rise, Newark is coming back, there's a lot of economic opportunity and development. However, no media outlet is really covering the story of Newark anymore. What we're trying to do at Newark, Inc., and they brought me in to do, was to tell the story of Newark's moving forward, story by story, day by day. Business, politics, arts, education, all together, all intertwined together, Newark moving forward. It's interesting. You, you have a background. Uh, one of the most impressive political reporters in the state. You covered uh, for Politicker. Correct. Um, the Newark mayor's race. Yes. And we just in that chair, I told you just a few hours ago, uh, Roz Baraka was sitting there, mm -hmm. um, the mayor of Newark. How significant has his tenure been so far? I think his, his tenure is significant in the fact that one of the themes of the 2014 Newark mayoral election was, look at Ross Baraka's background. He's the son of 
Leroy Jones, a.k.a. Amiri Baraka, radical poet and playwright. So they expected that the son would be exactly like the father. Now, the son is proud to be his father's son. Very. But, you know, Howard University educated, you know, very bright. A, a principal at Central High School for 20 years. He came out of the tradition of his father and his mother, who are both very important to him. But at the same time, he's his own man. And I think he has demonstrated as mayor of Newark that he knows what he needs to do at a time when the state isn't going to help Newark particularly well. He's reaching out to business community. He's reaching out to all communities. I live in the Iron Bound. And I don't think Ross Barack had a lot of voters in the Iron Bound, but my neighbors are saying, hey, listen, we can't say anything else. He's doing a pretty good job. Mm. He's not ignoring us. The major issues in the city, uh, number one, crime? Crime and education. Break down the crime issue first. Are we talking violent crime, mostly connected to drugs and gangs? I would think so. I, mean, I would think that in some ways, the reports you hear out of the South Ward, it's about territory. It's about you've got one gang over here that's selling drugs on this corner, another gang over here selling drugs on this corner, and never the two should meet, and they fight. Um, and therefore, the level of violence, because of the level of money that is being made, is often astronomical and horrible and frightening. Um, at the same time, that is also, of course, tied to gun violence. They're not fighting with their hands. They're not even fighting with knives or baseball bats. It's guns. And leads to a whole other question about why there are so many guns in our cities. Oh, oh, what position does it put the police in? <sighs> a tricky one, because I know many Newark policemen. Many of them are my neighbors. They want to fight the war on crime. But they need help. Do, well, hold on one second. Do you feel to some extent, and the mayor talked about this, sure. that the Civilian Review Board right now in which certain incidents that take place between the police and citizens mm -hmm. um, now are reviewed by sure. civilians, by right. citizens. Do you feel to some extent the cops feel that they are under a microscope to the degree that they cannot do their job? I think that's certainly been a worry in the past, but at the same time, by having this review, you won't see what happens. One of the great worries that people have about Newark, oh, it's just going to be like 1967. Part of the problem is... the riots. Exactly. Riots or rebellion, to, depending on who you talk to. Right. You won't see the same problems with the police you had in 1967 if you have a review board. You won't see the same problems you've had in places like Baltimore and Cleveland and even Staten Island if you have that type of review board in place. It actually could cement the relationship between the community and the police rather than divide them further and therefore help the police to do their job better. Education. In uh, mm -hmm. 1995, the state took over the North Public Schools. Right. Uh, Ross Baraka sat here and said that he and Governor Christie, while they don't agree on very much, they have agreed on the fact that the city needs to take over the public schools again, even though Chris Cerf will be there sure. sitting on a chair in a few minutes, <laughs> um, who is coming in as the superintendent after Cammie Anderson, former um, state head uh, of education, Chris Cerf now coming in to run the Newark Public Schools. Bottom line is Newark ultimately will re-control, will control again the public schools. Sure. Is that a good thing? It all depends on how they manage it once they get in. There's been this constant drive for local control, and I can see the reasons why. People want to control their own destiny. Why wouldn't they want to control the educational destiny of their children? And, you know, Mr. Cerf, he's getting into the hot seat in terms of this. You know, Cammie Anderson, his predecessor, was highly controversial. Now Mr. Cerf has to come in. But going forward, you know, local control is critical. But at the same time, you only hope that, again, you know, with Ross Barak in place, who was an educator himself, that the same mistakes that led to the state having to come in in 95 do not get repeated. I can only hope not. Mark, let me ask you this. You, you talked about the fact that your site has been created because the mainstream media really hasn't done a very good job covering New York. Why do you think that is? That's a very good question. I think part of it is um, the daily paper that had been here for decades no longer has its offices. You're talking about the Star Ledger. I am. It's not really the New York Star Ledger anymore. It's the Woodbridge Star Ledger or wherever they have the office park where that media entity is now located. It's like the Dodgers leaving Brooklyn. You know? now, is that really the right analogy? That the, I mean, the Dodgers were Brooklyn. The Star-Ledger was housed in Newark, but was a statewide newspaper. That's true, but at the same time, there used to be far more coverage of what took place in Newark, both in City Hall. Now it seems that a lot of the coverage, 
And again, I know people who work at the Star Ledger, I respect them. And, and full disclosure, we have a relationship, a cross-promotional relationship with the Ledger, so I need to say that publicly. Exactly. But go ahead. But at the same time, a lot of the coverage you see in that newspaper now is solely about crime. And there's far many more stories to be told in Newark. Even the story of, yes, there is, unfortunately, you'll see sometime, particularly in the summer, a body count. But why did that happen? What is the meaning behind context? this? Yes, there needs to be context. There needs to be more deeper understanding. This is a challenge to all newspapers everywhere. Investigative reporting is in trouble. We want to go deeper. We want to tell Your the story site of Newark will better. Go deeper? Absolutely. We want to tell the story of Newark better and in a more deeper way and with more context. And real quick, before I let you out of here, engaging people. Um, how can people engage through the site? Well, there's social media. There's Twitter. There's Facebook. We're trying definitely to do this through social media. Also, it's important to be visible. You know, I live here. I care about this city. I will engage anyone, anytime, as the public face of this website. Because it's too important what's happening now for Newark. Newark has a future. And Newark, people need to know Newark has a future. And, and finally, you're... I'm not going to say bullish, confident? Yes, I am. Quietly confident. Because I see what people are going through every day in the streets. I know what they feel. I know what they hear. Mm -hmm. And they know Newark's coming back. Mark, uh, we wish you nothing but the best. Thank uh, you very you much. And colleagues over at NewarkInc.com. And uh, as a media partner, we'll continue to try to tell the story together. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you for your time, sir. You Thank got you. it. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato at NJIT has been provided by NJIT, The Fidelco Group, Barnabas Health, Prudential Financial's Global Communications Department, TD Bank, Verizon Communications, and by PSE&G. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. One on One with Steve Adubato at NJIT has been produced in cooperation with Fios One News. I think at NJIT there are a lot of smart students. I came to NJIT for mechanical engineering because within state it's one of uh, probably the top three schools for engineering. It sort of creates a friendly competition where you know you can learn from them. It's a great academic school. I feel I'm being challenged, but at the same time I love the classes I'm taking. The atmosphere of being here is like a, being at an upstart company. It's that same kind of drive, that same kind of passion.